I'm Miwa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over. And I'm with Timothy Snyder today. And most readers will know him from On Tyranny, which was, well, a very sharp, smart, short book about where we are in our world right now. The new book is called On Freedom. And I have to say, I'm still thinking about what I've read now twice in the new book. And it seems to me, Timothy, that the roots of On Freedom are not just in the work that you've been doing, but also in an earlier book, Our Malady, which came out in 2020, which is roughly the same size as On Tyranny, but relates directly to a very scary health situation you had where, frankly, you almost died. Yeah, this is all true. Um, I'm very glad to be able to talk to you about this. And um, I'm really happy to try to figure out for myself where the book came from. The new book on freedom is about positive freedom. It's about trying to decide what freedom actually is. And the way that it comes out of On Tyranny is that On Tyranny was a little political pamphlet about fending what we have, which of course raises the question of what is it that we have and how would we define it? And assuming we get past the latest crisis, what would we want America to be like? And then the little book that you nicely mentioned, Our Malady, is a little tiny part of the answer to that question. I, I started writing that book when I was in the hospital bed where I almost died. And w while I was ill and while I was going through a series of health crises, which were entirely avoidable, it did get me thinking about how the narrow way we think about freedom not only makes us less free, but puts our lives at risk. And that things, and that this whole idea that safety and freedom or security and freedom are in some kind of tension, basically wrong. And that one of the ways to start thinking about freedom positively is to start thinking about what it would take for us not only to be healthier, but to be less worried about things like health. So our malady was kind of a step towards a much broader and more generous conception of freedom. My first note, actually, in my galley of on freedom is expansiveness. I just, I felt like the argument you were making in the new book just took me to places I had not previously considered about freedom, and it felt much more open-ended. It felt bigger. I mean, it just felt more expansive. And I feel like as much as we talk about freedom, we silo it. We really, really silo it, whether it's the political, the social, the economic, the, and you bring everything together, sort of using five major points. And we're going to dip in and around the argument because I do want people to be able to read the book the way I did both times, sort of straight through, uninterrupted, being able to sit with an argument that draws from philosophy, history, current affairs. I mean, you are pulling from so many different places. And then we also get your childhood. In Ohio, we get a little bit of baseball even, which I was not expecting the baseball part. I really wasn't. But I love the idea that we're able to look at this more as sort of net positive than what do we lose if we don't have it. And I feel like all of the conversations that we've had, say, in the last 10, 15, even 20 years have been Either we're ignoring freedom as a concept or we're pushing to say what happens if it's gone, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we've, we've trapped ourselves in all of those ways. I think we trap ourselves as Americans by talking about freedom so much. I think we, we fill up the whole space with the word and then there's not very much room for the idea and there's not very much room for moving around and there's not very much room for actually thinking what it would take to be a free person. And so I really like I really like your word expansiveness, because what I'm thinking is that freedom is the thing which allows all of the other good things. Yeah. So whatever all the other good things are, mm -hmm. it's freedom which enables us to affirm them. So it's not that freedom is the highest value exactly, but it's the value which enables all the other value, value values. And then this becomes expansive socially or politically as well, because if we think about freedom that way, then we have to ask, what are the social or what are the political conditions in which we become the people who can affirm lots of different values? How does that come about? And if we start the question that very basic way, then mm -hmm. we're thinking about things we wouldn't ordinarily think of in connection with freedom, like 
childbirth and early childhood education and education in general and our relations with the environment and with technology. And I think one has to do that because, as you say, otherwise, freedom becomes a silo. It actually becomes something kind of invisible. We, it's a word that we use all the time, but actually it's not a thing. <laughs> it doesn't actually appear. It's not, it's not palpable. So I'm concerned with treating it with the seriousness that it deserves. And part of that is affirming what kind of political system, what kind of social conditions we would need. Because mm -hmm. usually the people who say freedom is the most important thing, what they mean is, okay, we have to do nothing. Everything's fine, right? Freedom means not doing this, not doing that. Freedom means government can't do this, government can't do that. I think that's entirely the wrong way of looking at it. I think the right way of looking at it is to say, what does government do that enables freedom? Not everything government does enables freedom, but what could a government do that would enable freedom? I mean, you talk about freedom as a daily practice, and it's taking action. It's thinking about, and you say this throughout, but it's, it's thinking about not just other people in sort of a squishy, warm way, but if you treat other people with the seriousness that you would apply to yourself, you end up becoming a much more reasonable human being. And that, that difference between reasonable and rational, I think, is not just semantics. And I'm wondering if we can start there. First of all, you, this is the first conversation I've had about this book, and you're completely spoiling me. <laughs> like, like right now with that question you're spoiling me because that is that is that's a, that's a part of the book i was actually just reading that book aloud because i'm that part of the book aloud because i'm recording it now and that's the part of the book that i that i love the most and which i think is the most grounding part so the way that people generally speak about freedom when they talk about freedom negatively is they assume you are a rational person. You know, you know your own stuff. I'm a rational person. I know my own stuff. And it's like in the economics textbooks. We just go out there and we like buy an apple if we want an apple. We buy a car if we want a car. But the whole assumption is we are rational and we're individuals. We know ourselves. And I think that is a wrong turn. Like that's a wrong turn coming right out of the garage. You're going to miss the road completely if you take that turn. Because we do not, in fact objectively know ourselves all by ourselves. The only way to objectively know ourselves is to see ourselves the way other people see us. And the only way to do that is to assume that other people are the same kind of being that we are, that they're going to, that, that, that they were born, they're going to die, they face similar kinds of predicaments. And so in that light, empathy, like become, it's not, empathy isn't niceness. Empathy isn't just this, you know, extra, it's not this super erogatory fluff. Empathy is the thing that you actually need to understand yourself before you can start reasoning as a free person. So right from the very beginning, we're stuck with each other. You can't really be free as an atomized individual. That's a total fantasy. And it's not just a mistake. It's a political and social error which drives us towards this world where, in fact, a lot of us are de facto not very free because we've accepted from the get-go that we already know everything. And that makes us naive. It makes us easy to manipulate. It makes us easy to push around. It makes us easy to, to, to treat as, as, as objects. Well, empathy gives us context, right? It gives us context and it gives us community. And I think it's really, especially when you look at sort of this, mytho this great American mythology, right? Especially, you know, in the context of the American West, for instance, where we're all going to open up a country that has never been explored and we're the first and we're... I grew up in Boston, you know, city on the hill, shining example, all of that kind of stuff. So we give ourselves these mythologies that put us sort of front and center in a way where actually we're kind of not. I mean, we're essentially, I don't want to say lying to ourselves, that might be a little too strong, but we are certainly not telling ourselves the truth. There, 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 there are two parts in that, I think. One part is, like you say, universal that if you think of the free person as the that cowboy you know or you think of the free person as that that brilliant the, the brilliant preacher um giving the speech about a city on the hill whoever you're thinking about whether you're thinking about you know john winthrop or daniel boone who, whoever that whatever your idea of a free of freedom is the moment you think of that person as just an individual at the height of his and in these images it usually is his 
if you send a person at the height of his achievements, you're then clouding out, you're occluding all of the things which enable that person to be free. The family, the mother, the institutions, whatever went into it. And so that very image of freedom allows us to lie to ourselves. And it also allows us, it allows us to, to disempower ourselves and to make ourselves unfree. Because if, the, if, if that's the notion, if we just think of that person on top of a mountain or winning a race or whatever it might be, we're never going to get there if we just think that person did it all by themselves because they didn't. And then underneath that in your question, I would just like to pull out the historical part, which is that our notion of freedom, the wrong notion of freedom, as I see it, the negative notion of freedom is based precisely on a world that no longer exists. It used to be possible to call yourself free because you took land and because you enslaved other people and because you controlled women. And that is, in fact, the traditional notion of freedom. I am free because I control land and I control other people. And then I want a negative idea of freedom because I don't want the government to get in the way of that. And that's where the whole negative idea of freedom comes from. It comes from people who are established on property with various kinds of servitude underneath them. And, and so, so long as we're trapped historically in that, we can't see our way clear to a 21st century idea of freedom. Because, you know, the, the moral problem with all that aside, and of course, the moral problem is profound and unavoidable, but the moral problem aside, it's also just not attainable that people aren't going to be free that way anymore. It, may, it was wrong to be free in a colonial way, but it's also now just impossible. And so we have, that's one more reason that we have to drop the negative freedom tradition and, and think anew about how, what kinds of social situations, what kind of political situations, what kind of behavior would actually allow all of us to be free. Unpredictability was the thing that surprised me when we were talking about freedom, because it's partially the way we sort of approach history once we leave school in a way, right? You're taught history in sort of very specific ways and specific timelines and point of views and whatnot. But, well, you put it very sort of plainly that if we're predictable to things outside of ourselves, we're easily manipulated. We are the least free we could possibly be. And, you know, there are people who would say, well, being unpredictable is is not what we want. We want to be able to say, well, the, the weather's going to do this, or there will or won't be an earthquake, or prices will do this, or housing will do this. And yet, yeah, I really appreciate seeing unpredictability in there as sort of one of the terms and conditions of genuine freedom. So can I ask you to riff off of that a little bit? I think, I think it's really essential. I think it's really essential. I think it is the essential thing, and it's probably the most important philosophical revision that I'm making, because up until now, it's been, ration, it's been rationality, which has been at the core of ideas of, of freedom. And I don't think it's rationality. I think it's, in fact, unpredictability, which sets us apart from other things in the universe and which gives us a chance to be free. So, I mean, there's a, there's a very basic, profound way in which I'm concerned with this, which is the, we, we make the world around us predictable. We, we understand the world around us. but we are the thing which can escape that if we choose. But there's a particular way we escape it, and that is by being human. That is by affirming values. If you are loyal to your friends, or if you value you know, the beautiful prose of a book, or if you are honest with your colleagues, every time you affirm a value, you're doing something which isn't just there predictably in the universe. You're doing something which then pushes out unpredictability into the universe. We can do it, and we can share it, and we can thereby change the world. But only if we choose to, and only if we believe in those values, and only if we're constantly working through them and affirming them and trying to realize them. So it's what sets us out from the rest of the universe. It makes us really special. And I think we're tempted to dodge that, right? We'd rather think, okay, I am just like a billiard ball, and I am just like a rock falling down a mountain. You know, so much of our social science and a lot of our philosophy, certainly a lot of economics, tells us, oh, you're just like a rock. You know, you're basically just one more thing bouncing around. And that's comforting in a way because it relieves us from all the responsibility of having to be a moral person. So that's part of it. Like we're, we're special. We can be unpredictable. The second part of it is biographical. Like when I'm, you know, I'm raising children and when I look at children, I like to think that child could do something besides what the people around it did. That child could have its own idea of life. That child could grow up and be something special. That child can rebel productively. And if, if, if there is freedom, it has to mean that. 
Freedom can't just be, I'm already 48 years old. Um, no, sorry. I mean, truth in advertising. I'm, I'm going to be 55 when the book comes out. But it can't be like I'm already 70 or I'm already 25 and I'm just making a consumer choice. Freedom right. has to mean from the beginning of life, that kid can have ideas about what that kid wants to be and realize them. And that, and that those things can't be predictable to the mom or the dad or the boss or the teacher or the professor or whatever. They have to be that child's own notion of life, that child's own unique notion of notion of life. And then the, the other part of it is, is, is defensive, as you've already said, that if we are predictable, that literally means that something can predict us, something or someone. And if something or someone can predict us, then that something or someone can rule us. And of course, this has always been true in politics, but it's all the more true in the digital age where so much of our everyday environment is a confrontation with algorithms which are not only trying to predict us, but which are trying to make us more predictable. So, um, for in all so, so for all those reasons, the the universal, the biographical, but also the technological unpredictability is right at the heart of the book. And that comes out of education too. I mean, you talk about all of the different ways math and physics and natural sciences and of course literature and history, but I mean, you're not leaving out the other bits either. And it's that education and literacy, whether it's literal or media literacy, for instance. And, and all of that comes up against data collection and algorithms and isolation. I don't think we're having the larger conversation about isolation as a culture and a society. I don't think we're having the larger conversation about isolation and what that's doing to people. I mean, you, I'm, I'm sure everyone's heard it at this point, you know, being lonely is the equivalent of smoking X amount of cigarettes or whatever. It's not that pithy, though, because we have people in our society who believe that they are connected to the larger world in a way that they actually aren't, because mm -hmm. they don't recognize or realize even that they're being fed information back to them on a loop. And I think when you see that, you lose so much of all of the other pieces, right? The empathy that you're talking about and empathy leading to being, well, more genuine in a way and, and not, again, not being predictable, I think. Yeah, the, though that's absolutely right. And it, it has to do, first of all, with, with the body. So. I mean, the, in, in the empathy argument that I'm making, I'm relying on a philosopher called Edith Stein, who, who made the point that we, we, we really, we, be, we, could, we believe that someone else is there when we recognize their body. And then when we, when we understand that they have the same bodily predicament that we do, that they're alive, they're aging, they're going to die, they can see some of their body, but not all of it, and so on and so forth, that, that just like us, they're in this predicament, then we become more reasonable about ourselves. And the converse of that is that when we don't confront other people's bodies, when we just, when we confront bots, and it is mainly bots, when we confront bots and trolls and people who don't know us over a screen, it's a very special kind of confrontation, one which innervates us, one which draws us into known behaviorist patterns, which make us predictable, right? Mm. The algorithms are set up so that we're affirmed, 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 and then scared. And we know that that is what draws us in. And so the, the, the data that we reveal, like it's almost too much to say that it's data because it's all part of a known pattern of drawing people in, not drawing them out, drawing them into something which isn't really real. And then, then that creates in turn biological habits where it becomes harder to deal with other people. It becomes harder to confront people who have feelings that are different than your own or ideas that are different than your own. It becomes harder to make eye contact, harder to have a conversation. And, and I want to add to that that the, the rhetoric of freedom here is pointed in exactly the wrong direction in our country on this point, because people will essentially say, well, I should be free to spend 18 hours a day staring at my screen or whatever it is. And, you know, the the big um, and the, the, the tech oligarch should be free to control huge amounts of our daily life um, and make money from it. But that's not actually freedom. There's nothing free about that. For, for the consumer, you're only free if you understand, as you said already, you're only, you're only free if you understand the environment that you're in. You're only free mm -hmm. if you understand how the algorithms work. You have to understand their predictability 
in order to make yourself unpredictable. And as far as like the ownership of this, of this information space, there, there's, there's nothing liberating about having one person control everything, right? Like that's, that's exactly wrong. And the only way you get to that is by a negative freedom argument, which says everything the government does is bad, rather than starting from the humans. Like we have to start from the humans. Like the average American spends four and a half days, not just four and a half hours, not just looking at screens, but looking at a phone every day. Okay. So given that we spend, you know, a, a, a third, a quarter of our waking day staring at a phone, how, what would you do to make that experience more liberating, right? Start from there rather than starting from how can one or two people make the most money from it? Well, I'm also going to quote you for a second. When you say, when we forget the why and have only the how, our imagination seeps into the gully of the status quo. And we have, in a way, forgotten how to interrogate, right? How to interrogate what is happening around us and why it's happening. I mean, why is a question I really like, and I have liked it since I was old enough to speak for the first time. And I had adults around me who were willing to entertain the constant why. I think that's how I ended up becoming a bookseller, to be perfectly honest. But how and why are absolutely not the same question. And yeah. I'm, I'm going to ask you to expound on that a little bit because it yeah. really is... You are, I mean, you really are spoiling me. I think this is going to be my last conversation about the book. I'm going to wrap it up right here. That's also a very, very essential point. The why, the why is what makes us special. The how, the how doesn't. Why, why? So why is a moral question? It has to be a moral question because it, what it's touching on is the, the way the world should be. So if I ask how to build that bookcase behind you, that's fine. But I ask why books, why a bookcase, why a collection of books, then the answer has to do with affirming things like memory and creativity or respect for authors, or whatever it might be. There's no way to answer a why question without moving into the moral universe. And that moral universe is where we can be free. And so the tr and, and that's basically the central argument of the book that as humans, we 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 have contact with this moral universe, and in so and it, the freer we are, the the freer the contact, and the more choices we make about things more or less important, the 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 more of a character we can build up, and it's that creation of character which is which is freedom. Whereas, as you say, what happens instead is that we get seduced into the how, the how is is portrayed as the why. So we we in our culture we really like words like like productivity and maximization and efficiency. But the thing is, th those are all how words. They're not why words, right? And so we, we let ourselves get driven into the situation where we are more and more productive and we maximize and so on, and we're more efficient. But we're not in the habit as a culture of asking for what, right? And so it's like, we're, you know, you run around the gerbil wheel, but you never ask what the cage is for. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and so that's, a, that's, it's really central. Because the how question assumes that if everything is about how, it means you don't have the right to ask why. But always back in the background, somebody else is asking why. And if, if they are and you're not, then they're the ones who are exercising power over you. And why takes the edge off of things and takes the power out of things like nostalgia, right? Nostalgia is, it's real. There are people who really can use it to and ends. But nostalgia isn't necessarily healthy, and it's not necessarily based in factuality, which is also something that you hold on tightly to in this book, where people, you know, you can, you can tell a thing, and if you tell it enough times, and even if people didn't really believe it to start with, if it gets its, well, if it gets purchase, right? If an idea gets purchase, even if it doesn't have true believers, it just continues to go. I mean, we see this, you bring up Václav Havel, who's a writer I love. And of course, was, I went looking for my copy of Open Letters and I may have loaned it to someone and I could not find it. And I was not thrilled about that, but it is the kind of book that you loan quite a lot. And here he is, a poet and a playwright who becomes president of Czechoslovakia. And I love his art. I love everything about this guy and even his love of the Velvet Underground. But Havel, to me, understands sort of the larger balance between how and why. When I started reading Havel, mm -hmm. which was in the late 1980s, um, just before the revolution, revolutions of 1989, there were parts to him that I did not really understand. 
And I think, I now think those were the deepest parts. Havel was categorized at the time, and appropriately enough, as an anti-communist writer. And that was true in a limited way. But what he was really concerned with was our participation in our own unfreedom. The, the, the ways that our language and our everyday behavior make us co-participants in a process of being unfree. And he was obsessed precisely with predictability mm-hmm. and the way in which a combination of power and of power, political power and technology could make us more predictable. And he was quite convinced, and so I'm borrowing a lot of this from him, he was quite convinced that freedom has to involve transcendence. It has to involve playfulness. It has to involve authenticity, being true to the things that you really care about, the things you really care about. Maybe you're a little ashamed of them. You know, maybe they're not usual, but it has to do with, using his terms again, it has to do with being normal in the sense of affirming the life that you think is normal, as opposed to normal in the sense of going along with what everyone else is doing. And that, that distinction between the two kinds of normal seems to me to be really, really important. Like there's the conformist normal. There's the how normal. There's the everybody else is doing it normal, the, the bullying normal, right? And then there's the normal of the world that you think should be, like what you think would be normal, the norms you want to set, the life you'd like to live. And you give up one for this, you give up one for the sake of the other, and then and then you're lost, right? And so that puts unfreedom on the side of predictability, but freedom on the side of unpredictability, because the things that we really care about, honestly, are always, un- if we're honest about them, are unpredictable. Part of your argument, too, and this comes right back to unpredictability, you need time. Freedom mm-hmm. needs time, and it needs not just time as a runway, but also time for a visionary. And, and Havel was doing this. This is exactly what you're saying. And you actually, the essay, Power of the Powerless. And then we get this amazing, amazing piece, which again, he is, it is that vision, right? And he's saying, if we project ourselves into the future, we can not blow everything up, but he's living under a regime that is not, necessarily oriented towards the humane or humanity. I mean, we know what Eastern Europe looked like up until the Velvet Revolution, and it was a very different landscape. And here's this guy saying, oh, no, 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 no. I get it. And if we, ha- if we just have the time. So that intersection of time and humanity and vision and everything else do you weigh these differently or do they all just come as a set? There, I really appreciate your thinking about time because I think one of the ways that we become unfree is that there are no moments. Right. I think that's one way of characterizing part of what you're saying. There aren't moments. There are seconds, there are minutes, there are nanoseconds. There might even be years, but there are no moments. The, the, a moment is when something happens and you appreciate it and you encode it and you remember it and you might recall that later and it has significance to you and it might have take on significance later in a different way. That's a moment. Right. And to be free, one has to have moments. And, and we are constantly tempted, partly by the tech, not to have moments, to just move from one thing to another to another so that nothing is ever really humanly processed or appreciated. But time also comes into it in a different way, I think, which is that we only we live a life in one order. Yeah. And the things that happen to us don't unhappen. Yeah. And this is especially relevant with childhood. Like if we want to be if we want to be free, we have to make sure that kids have time to to play. And Mm -hmm. it seems silly, but, you know, that they have time to play, that that they're with other people, that that older people have time for them. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the really simple arguments I make in the book is that older people can give a special kind of time to younger people. And then younger people can only pay that back when they're older themselves. And it's a very simple point. Um, but because we now know that some of the faculties we need for freedom are developed mainly when we're very young, that moment when we're, when we're children has to be central to this whole, to the whole consideration. And what follows from that is that, I mean, it's kind of a radical version of the whole argument, which is that if that's true, then we have to set up life, which means setting up politics in such a way that people have time for kids. 
And that that's not just some kind of luxury, some kind of benefit, as we like to say. You know, it's not, it's not just some detail in some kind of welfare state. It's essential, it's essential for freedom, not just for happiness or for family values or whatever that, that means, but that it's essential for freedom that we have time. And so there are different, like, it's one, I think just in the book, I talk about the five dimensions and the fourth mm -hmm. is time. And I try to stress that freedom is in all five dimensions, right? not just the billiard ball view of the world, the three dimensions where we're bounced around predictably, but also that there's time and there are different kinds of time. And knowing that there are different kinds of time, I think, helps us to plot freedom. And just one more little thing, it has to be generational for this reason, right? Like nobody can just decide when they're seven or 17 that they're free. The, the things that allow that seven-year-old or that 17-year-old to have a chance to be free, many of them have to already be set up before that child is aging into, into maturity. And so freedom can't be this instantaneous thing. Like it has to have its own time. And part of its time is actually, I think, generational time. And then that hooks into why freedom has to involve government, because there are generational arrangements, like childcare precisely, like education precisely. There are generational arrangements where people need some kind of larger structure to make it happen. And, um, and that, that freedom is an argument for those kinds of arrangements is, is something that I hope to be persuasive about. Well, and also that kind of structure that you just described leads to greater mobility, right? The fact that in many ways we are at a moment in our culture and our society where we are, generally speaking, immobile. And I don't mean in the literal sense of you move down the road. I mean sort of class movement. I mean building new infrastructure for travel, all larger scale. It, it literally, I'm, I'm not just talking about, you know, buying a new house and moving down the street. And that sense of mobility leads you to have hope for the future. It leads you to believe that there is a possibility for change, whatever that happens to look like. I mean, we've seen it in communities where hospitals are put out of business or schools, suddenly everyone's on the bus for four hours because there isn't just a local setup. Mm -hmm. And when you take those pieces out, when you take out the health piece, when you take out the education piece, when you take out something as simple as jobs, if you think about how many jobs have disappeared in parts of America, that mobility, I th think we need to raise that higher in the conversation. I, I do I do think that there is a segment of the population that feels left out a little bit. And I'm wondering how we help them. And certainly on Freedom, the book is going to help. But if you're just speaking to someone that you're sitting next to, how do we help people make that connection a little faster, maybe? Yeah. So many interesting things in that question. I want to I want to just loop, I want to loop back something you suggested earlier, which I never quite caught up to, which it has to do with predictability and unpredictability. Yeah. We should be unpredictable. But the way we get there is by making a lot of the world around us predictable. Right. So you want it to be predictable that there is health care. Mm -hmm. You want it to be predictable that there are schools for your kids and that they're nearby. Right. You want it to be predictable, now moving on to this question, that there's a job market and that the job market is open and that job market is diverse and interesting. You want that to be predictable. You want that to be there when, when, a, when a young person, you know, hits hits 18 or 21 or 25 or whenever it is and enters the job market, you want that job market to be there all over the country with interesting things to do with, with jobs that are secure. Like you, that part you want to be predictable because that predictability on the outside allows us to be unpredictable on the inside because we need to dream dreams and have values, but then we have to, th those things have to make contact with the world, which means that the world has to be set up in a certain way. With the present moment, there are at least two levels to the problem. One is the political level, which is that it's become very hard to imagine a future at all. Right. So for us to be free and mobile, we have to imagine moving, as you say, in space over time or this over the course of a life, moving in the sense of maybe moving where we live, but also changing jobs, becoming educated, meeting new people, right? Mm -hmm. All of that is mobility. But for me to have an individual hope of a future, I have to believe in the future in general. <laughs> And that has been a, a tremendous political change of the last 15 years or so has been the demolition of the future. And if the future itself is demolished, then it's hard for people to imagine their own particular futures in it. And then in terms of what, you know, in terms of how this plays out in a discussion with a, with a specific person, 
I think the stakes are exactly what freedom means. Does freedom mean that you say that everything is fine? You insist that everything's okay? Because that's what a lot of people want you to do, right? Everything is fine, you know, or maybe it was better 20 years ago, but everything's fine. I can just sit here. Or does freedom mean that you or your kids or the next generation have a chance of branching out, doing something different? I think that like that's a conversation which is actually going on now. And I think the answer is very clearly, you're not free if you reflexively insist on the status quo, right? If you reflexively insist on the status quo, you've been drawn into a narrative about how nothing can really change, about how everything is just the way it has to be the way it is, or maybe it should be the way that it was. And those are both completely dead ends. It doesn't have to be the way that it is, and it can't be the way that it was. If we're going to be free, then we have to have ideas of how each of us can move, right? So there's like a there's an imaginative part of that, but there's also an institutional part of that. And so quite literally, building roads is about freedom. Quite literally, having accessible public universities is about freedom. Like I'm I'm sitting in a, you know, I'm I'm sitting on the farm where I where my my mother grew up. And, you know, since the time that she grew up, they they built the highways, which allowed her and her sisters to go to public, a public university, which at that time was very inexpensive. Like that infrastructure, that is literally an infrastructure of mobility and therefore infrastructure of freedom. I mean, I think of City University of New York, right, which has changed the trajectory of countless people here. And I just, I love the idea that the university was affordable, mm -hmm. that you could work it around a schedule where you also maybe had a job or, you know, helped raise your siblings or whatnot. But what people were able to accomplish because they could afford public education was, I mean, it's when you look at some of the writers and some of the historians and some of the biographers and some of the scientists that come out of these places, yeah. it's amazing. It's part of who we are. Right. Yeah. And so to take that mobility away, just, and sometimes we do it of our own volition. I'm like, why do we do this? Why? Because we can't stop time. Right. I feel like the last sort of couple of decades, we've been shuffling back and forth between these moments where people are like, can we just stop time? And it's and I've heard people with children say this, too, where they're just like, well, if I could keep my kids certain age or, and my parents used to say it about my brother and I all the time. But we can't stop time. I'm not interested in stopping time. I want to see how we evolve. A language is the first example that I can think of. Right. Language should change. Otherwise, we'd all sound like John Winthrop, and I would prefer not to sound like John Winthrop. Thank you very much. L language should be alive. It should be the thing that snaps and pushes you forward. And sometimes that's books. Sometimes it's spoken word. I mean, language can represent a million different things. And so this idea that time and unpredictability come together, and then you layer in one more thing, which is, well, we study history for a reason. History is the bulwark. History is the factuality that gives us something to build the rest of the conversation around. And okay, history nerd, totally admit it, have a BA in history, was not an English major. But I think it matters. I think we have to know what came before us and we have to be willing to rewrite it. I think of your colleague, Ned Blackhawk, and the rediscovery of America. I think of Clint Smith and his book, How the Word is Passed, or the work that Taya Miles does. Her new book on Harriet Tubman is fantastic. Um, certainly uh, All That She Carried, which won the National Book Award as well. Like, we can look at history again and be like, oh, yeah, we missed some stuff the first time. Here's what we were missing, and we should all be participating in that. And you obviously have spent a lot of your career in Eastern Europe, Russia, Ukraine. Poland. Yeah, no, Poland, right. Them. Okay. So there's this big swath, though, but you were there during periods of really significant upheaval. And predating 2022, if I think of Eastern Europe in the early 90s and what changed, I mean, we saw the dissolution of the USSR, we saw the Velvet Revolution, we saw things that you and I might not have thought we were going to see in our lifetimes. That is a very helpful moment because mm -hmm. every, pretty much everyone thought that the Soviet Union would go on forever. And it's, it's, it's very helpful to notice somebody else thinking that their system is inevitable. Right. Because it then maybe you will notice, again, it's empathy. Maybe you will notice that you're, you're saying similar things about your own system, right? 
it helps it helps to notice that somebody else is saying, well, we understand the relationship between technology and freedom and we figured it all out. That was the Soviet Union. And the mm-hmm. language of Silicon Valley today is actually startlingly, shockingly similar to yes. the language of the Soviet Union in the 1980s. It's really striking. The same confidence that technology is going to resolve freedom. Okay, maybe it didn't, but now there's no alternative. Exactly the same arc in in language. What I'm making now is a very specific historical observation. But as you say, you can't you don't have access to the richness of the present, or you don't have ways of characterizing the present without comparisons from the past. You you lack a whole vocabulary. And it's a special kind of vocabulary because it's a vocabulary which allows you to see possibilities, not just a critique, which is what I just did, mm-hmm. but more like what you were saying. The future doesn't hold every possibility, like not everything is possible. Yeah. And if you think everything is possible, you're going to be quickly disillusioned and bang mm-hmm. your head against the wall, right? Like if mm-hmm. you think you can just make a revolution from nothing, knowing nothing, you're going to be very frustrated very quickly. You're going to give up. You're going to become, you know, you can become reactionary, whatever. You'll become a nihilist. But many, many, many things are possible, like far more than we realize. But all of them are in some way rooted in the past. And so the more that you get of the past, the more lines you see, possible lines going through the present into many different futures. So knowing more about history is actually empowering. It's not disempowering. It's not a weight. It's, it's on, the, on the contrary, it lifts you through the present, like to a perspective where you can see many more futures, which you wouldn't otherwise have seen. And part of that history, too, is the local newspapers. You and I share an opinion that the loss of local reporting is one of the local newspapers, absolutely public service, without a doubt, public service. We, every year when the Pulitzers were announced, you would see, you know, between two and five, tiny papers, exposing corruption, telling the truth about their community, winning Pulitzers. And a lot of those reporters went on to the Washington Post and the Los Angeles Times and the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune and the Dallas Morning News. That's where sort of that community and the humanity came together with, well, the reality and following the money. And to have that be lost, right, that sort of sense of community history, right? You're, t- you're from a town, you know the place, you know the landscape, you know the players, you know the people, you know all. And I think that we need to figure out how to create a new version of that town square because the internet has many, many benefits. I say this as a person who does lots of things online and gets lots of things done and not my grocery shopping, but the larger point. I'm not a Luddite. I'm delighted we have the internet in many ways. But, 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 but to have a physical thing that you can pick up and you used to do this too, but you would go through a tiny town and buy whatever newspaper was there because there's no better way to figure out the landscape than see what they're talking about and how they're talking about it and who's being heard. And, you know, it was great entertainment for 25 cents. It was delightful. And all of that has sort of gone away. And I do think that has untethered us in some ways from our communities. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that, that, that very palpability, the way that the local newspaper would include things that you yourself had seen. Yeah, so right. You didn't know like the score of the Little League game, but you drove by the park where it was happening. Maybe you didn't know that city councilman was corrupt, but, you know, you, 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 you saw his big car on the driveway and you won, you know. So that like it's the connection between the world you live in and then learning a bit more about it and being an informed citizen and eventually voter. And as you say, like that has to start locally. It can't start globally or nationally. It has to start locally, not only because of the training of the reporters, but also because of the training of the citizens of us. Because if we don't have the local reporters, then we think of everything as just being media, as people say. And media you like or you don't like, but it's far away from you. It doesn't have anything to do with you. You know, you choose your bit of it, then you get trapped in your own silos we were talking about earlier. And you lose the idea of truth because truth is ultimately, it is, I think, ultimately a kind of bodily notion. It has to do with things that you come into contact with. And then from that, you build out to more abstract versions of truth. But if you never get the local part, the bodily part, the the familial part, the part that has to do with your friends and your colleagues in your own place, you don't have the concept to apply more abstractly. And then you become the kind of person of which we now have all so many, where you just don't think anything is true. You think it's all an information game. It's all an information war. We're all just information warriors. There's no reality out there. And of course, that conclusion feels liberating for a moment, like, oh, I can just make my own reality. 
until you realize that in fact it's the people i mean this is very simple but it's in fact it's the people who control the social media platforms and who have the billions of dollars who are creating your reality for you and there's not anything you can do about it once you toss away the notion of truth because truth is the one thing it's, it's the one it's the one bit of ballast you have like it's where you can dig in your heels if you give up on truth then you have nothing to say right it's, it, you can just get overwhelmed by, by whatever else is out there. And so, yeah, so the bit on factuality, like it's not just that I'm saying truth is good. I'm also saying that, you know, which I believe it is, and I believe mm. there's a reason we should pursue, but it's also that truth is local. Truth is institutional. Truth is something that has to be built up from the ground. It has to be grown from the ground. It does, it's not just out there. Humans have to be employed, pleasantly employed, profitably employed, fruit, fruitfully employed to go out and hunt down those facts. And if we want to, if we want to be free, we can't do it without that texture of factuality. I think. I think too that there's something to be said for serendipity and discovery, and we miss that a lot yeah. when we're living online. I mean, I was at dinner with a friend the other night who said, "Well, I've curated my online experience in such a way, and it's an expansive curation in ways that not many other people would." But I think we all do it without thinking about it. I mean, certainly if there are ads I don't want to see or people I'm not into, I, I am perfectly happy to say, please hide this from me. Social media and the internet in general are tools for me. They're not, I mean, I live in a city where I, I share very small space with lots of people. And I love that. And I love that about newspapers where you don't necessarily know where the next page is going to take you kind of thing. And, and yes, it's nice to have the paper in my pocket on my phone sometimes, but that idea that there is more out there than simply exactly what you know, mm -hmm. and that we get to be, which leads me to a point that I also love that you make, imperfection. We get to be imperfect. All of this means that we are messy and imperfect as we figure out yeah. how to get where we need to go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I mean, what, one of the things that obsesses me is how any little any little township public library is a more unpredictable realm than the internet. If you just let yourself go into a little public library and walk the shelves, you will find something, some author that you did not know. You will find some subject on which you were ignorant, and you will have been led to it, as you say, serendipitously, but it will be real. And then that, that new knowledge that you have slices into your life, into your mind in this new, at this new angle, and then you're a slightly different person than you were before. Whereas if you'd spent that same half an hour, you know, running through loops on Twitter, you'd, you're going to be even more the same person, right? So libraries are unpredictable and books themselves are also much more unpredictable. Like any given good book is going to be unpredictable. It's always going to challenge. It's always going to have, there's always going to be some friction with the you who's reading, who's reading the book. I love the idea that there isn't, this isn't prescriptive, you're not prescriptive. You're actually battling, you're battling around with ideas, right, in this book in a way that yeah. is genuinely playful. Thank you. I mean, it's imperfection. Come on, who else would have, not everyone would have left imperfection in as an idea. That's all I'm Thank saying. You. But we have to be imperfect. This is the thing, the dream of perfection. I mean, there's the obvious, there's the obvious totalitarian point. Yeah, exactly. And that tradition from Zamyatin and Orwell and all those characters is in my book that there is a problem with totalitarianism, and the problem is thinking there's only one good thing. And so we can shape the world such that we were in conformity with that. That's a problem. And then there's also a problem of saying there's nothing which is good, right? Which is kind of, which is like the, that's the post-1989 version in Russia, but also here too. Like nothing's true, nothing's real, just let's let it all hang out. But that that's also um, very much a, a, a highway towards unfreedom because if nothing is true and nothing is real, then you just get pushed, you get pushed around. You have no way of defending yourself. Whereas what I think is right is that there are many good things and that there's no way and that there's a kind of geometry to the many good things. There is no way to get them all together. You can be honest with me. You know, you can be, you can be, you can be loyal to me, but you're always going to be making judgments about how those two things fit together, right? There's no perfect way to be both honest and loyal. But you're, you're, you're a free person insofar as you're negotiating how to get those good things together, right? And we make those kinds of choices all the time, but we're, they don't make us perfect. They just make us free, right? And so freedom can't be a matter of perfection. It has to be about, it, it's about accepting imperfection is actually good, right? It's not that like the perfect, the perfect is the enemy of the good. 
because because the good consists of a lot of good things which are different and which you can't quite get together. And that's what makes us special, right? Like that's what gets us out of the world of the billiard balls, the world where everything can be perfectly balanced or stacked. We're not in that world. And when we aspire to be in that world, we're aspiring not to be human and not to be free. You know, that seems like a really great place to wrap. And I know you and I could keep going. So I'm going to say thank you, Timothy Snyder. On Freedom is Out Now. If you haven't read On Tyranny, please do pick it up. It's also available as a graphic format. Now, I don't want to call it a graphic novel because it's not fiction, but it is available as a graphic treatment. And certainly, you know, I would say your bibliography is not insignificant. So I think there's plenty of stuff for folks to discover, but you can start there. Thank you so much for joining us on Port Over. It was a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.